How you going guys? Dean from Blog for the Blood God here. On today's episode of the Bloody Earth Podcast, I'm going to be discussing my two all-time favorite Chaos Space Marine units. We have the Dreadclaw, Drop Pod, and my favorite of all time, the Charybdis Assault Claw. I'm going to be discussing the changes, the recent changes in the FAQ for these two units, as well as some ideas on how you can get the most use out of them in your Chaos Space Marine army. So without further ado, Let's get straight into the episode. Hey, you going, guys? Dean from Blog for the Blood God here. And on today's episode of the Bloody Earth podcast, we're going to be talking about the Dreadclaw and the Charybdis Assault Claw, two of my all time favorite units in the Chaos Space Marine arsenal who have just received a fresh lease of life in the newest. FAQ update from Games Workshop. Uh, so first I'll just quickly explain what these units are for those of you who might not know. They're a Forge World Imperial Armor unit that's essentially a big scary drop pod that Chaos Space Marines have access to. So it's, it's, it functions like a drop pod but it has a whole ton of unique abilities that give it a significant advantage over the Loyalist uh, drop pod variant. Um, so we'll go through the Dreadclaw first. Basically, it's got a transport capacity of 10. It's toughness 6 with 9 wounds. It can arrive via drop pod assault, disembark out troops, and then in subsequent turns, it has like a 14-inch move or something to that effect. Any unit that it moves over, it can drop a, a little laser beam attack on, and then it can also charge and do damage in combat with a, I think it's a 3 damage strength 12 weapon with 4 attacks. So it's a unit that can be used to put your troops in it, to protect them turn 1 because they can't be targeted whilst they're off the table in strategic reserves, and then it can put them right in the heart of the battle, right where they need to be doing damage, and then it can continues to contribute to the fight afterwards by flying around, shooting laser beams at cunts, and punching cunts with its blade struts. It's a sick unit. I think they come in at 115 points, which is an absolute steal. And I really look forward to getting some more games in with these now that the FAQ has fixed one of their fatal flaws, which I'll touch on soon. Uh, the other unit that we'll be covering is the Charybdis Assault Claw. The reason that I'm doing these two together is because they're very similar units, but the Charybdis is essentially a bigger, badder, scarier version of the Dread Claw. So the Charybdis has uh, got, I think it's 28 wounds with toughness 8. Uh, this is going off the top of my head, but I'm pretty sure those figures are accurate. And it has a transport capacity of 20. Uh, and it also has a bunch of missile launches on the top of it. So it can shoot out 10 shots that are D6 damage as strength 8, I believe. So considerable firepower on top of its utility of being a transport which functions like the Dreadclaw where it can start off the table, arrive via strategic reserves, do massive damage on the drop, drop in a huge chunk of models and just generally be an absolute pain in the ass for your opponent. It also has a laser beam attack that can do mortal wounds to units that it flies over and it also punches people with its blade struts, only these ones are slightly more powerful, I think they're quite uh, a bit stronger with better AP. So, all in all, a similar unit to the Dreadclaw, but just with everything dialed up to 11. So, what is this recent FAQ update I hear you saying? The, uh, basically, when this unit was released, um, it has always had the ability to arrive via strategic reserves, and then the units inside could disembark that turn and then make charges and do all kinds of stuff. However, in the most recent Imperial Armor book, the ability to disembark was left off the data sheet, which basically meant that if you brought this unit, you could put guys inside and then you could drop in turn one, but your guys couldn't get out, which effectively rendered these units useless. And it was a pretty obvious oversight by uh, the Forge World Rules writers and the Games Workshop team. Now, unfortunately, what happened is not long after it was released, the book got an FAQ, and in that FAQ, nothing was changed for this unit. 
which then led people to believe that it might have been intentional and that they might have gone, okay, well, loyalist drop pods can't move, so you can disembark turn one, whereas these guys can move, so maybe there was some kind of differing dynamic in the way they intended for this unit to be used. That was the sort of the logic, the, the thought process that a lot of people went through. However, now Games Workshop have released their second round of FAQs, and in that round of FAQs they touched on the uh, Charybdis and the Dreadclaw and gave them these much sought after rules that they have sort of always had. Uh, it just, they've confirmed that it was indeed an oversight and that the unit is supposed to be able to do what it does. There is one other thing that hasn't been touched on in an FAQ that does affect these units. Um, so this is still very hotly debated and uh, I by no means claim to be an authority in the matter. But um, basically, the drop pod assault rule, it allows you to start with your units off the board in, in strategic reserves. And it specifically says in the data sheet something along the lines of that this unit and its contents are not considered when figuring out the total number of units allowed in strategic reserves. So basically the idea there is that you can take this unit and normally you can only have 50% of your army in strategic reserves, but this unit, the drop pod, the dreadclaw or the Charybdis, and its contents don't count towards that total, right? However, the way it's worded, doesn't, it doesn't share the same wording as the actual reserves limitation rule. So the, the limitation on your what you can put in reserves and what you can put in reinforcements it specifically says that you can only have half of your units and half of your points. Whereas this uh, drop pod rule says that it doesn't count towards the number of units that you can have in reserves. So technically, rules as written, it could be argued that, sure, this doesn't contribute to the number of units, but it does contribute to the amount of points that you can have off the table in reinforcements, which means that you couldn't, for example, put all of your models in Dreadclaws and Charybdis and then start them all off the table and null deploy. So that argument is still up for debate. I personally believe that the intent is pretty clear and the intent is that this unit and its contents don't count towards the limits, period. So it doesn't count towards either of those limits. And I think that the whole idea is that it's perfectly uh, narratively acceptable to have an entire army arrive via deep strike, via drop pods. That's cool as fuck. And I think that's the intent behind these units. And the intent is that it allows you, it's specifically done to allow you to go over that 50%. Otherwise the rule doesn't really make any sense. Why would it allow you to use more units, but not more points? That doesn't really make sense. So, I personally believe that it is supposed to be uh, ruled in such a way that you could start with all of your shit in the Charybdis, in the Dreadclaws, have nothing on the table, and then arrive by this brutal um, drop pot assault. However, currently, it depends on your TO, really. You, you ask the TO, I've had most of the TOs that I've asked have said that yes, that that is how they're going to rule it, but some of them say no. And if you've watched my recent episode on tournament organizers and their roles and responsibility, I personally think that this is a shit situation for a TO to be in because they're sort of forced to make a decision that's gonna upset someone. If they say yes, you can do it. It's gonna upset anyone that loses to you because they're gonna be like, oh, you only won because bullshit rules and you nah. whereas if they say no you're going to be like well why the fuck can't I it's obvious you know like so either way that the tournament organizers in for a shit time so if you do decide that you want to try and pursue the route of having everything in deep strike reserves just make sure you ask the TO and be respectful to the TO and be respectful and sympathetic for your opponents as well because they might not have planned for it they might not have expected it because they might be under the interpretation or under the assumption that the interpretation is that you can't do it. 
Anyway, with all of that said, let's talk about how fucking cool these units are. And if you want to play it safe, just put 50% of your army in those drop pods and put the other 50% of your army on the table. And that way you sort of get to have your cake and eat it too. You get to have fun with your dread claws, you get to have fun with your Charybdis, and you don't have to piss anyone off or cause any drama. That's probably the safest bet going forward. Uh, so basically the main thing about these units are, is they're a force multiplier. You wouldn't take one without troops inside. Whereas some, tr some vehicles you might, like I'm, I've got mates that bring rhinos in their lists and they don't even want anything in the rhino. They just want it so that they have this cheap, tough, durable unit that they can throw out onto an objective somewhere or, you know, screen out charges or do all kinds of things. Like the utility of a rhino is crazy. That doesn't necessarily apply the same here. These are much more expensive units and they're considerably different in the way that they function. So I view these guys almost exclusively as a force multiplier in that you can take a unit that might struggle to get up the table or it might struggle to be safe turn one, it might be quite vulnerable, and you can take that unit and give it a new lease of life by giving it one of these transports and giving it the, that extra movement, that extra mo mobility, as well as extra durability and support. So think of it like, uh, like a Dreadclaw, for example, is like a 115 point upgrade for a unit. Think of it in, the, in those sorts of terms, not as a unit that you would take in your list for the sake of taking the unit in your list. Um, now with that being said, what are some of the best units that you can put inside the Charybdis and the Dreadclaw? Now I actually think that these two transports, even though they serve a somewhat similar function, I think they have uh, quite a few differences in what is best to go inside them. So the main difference is the transport capacity. With a transport capacity of 20, you're actually better off putting large units in the Charybdis and multiple small units in the Dreadclaws because the Dreadclaw by definition can't take a large unit. And say you wanted to do four units of five, I would actually advise taking two Dreadclaws and putting two units of five in each as opposed to taking one Charybdis with four units of five. Uh, the reason that is is because if you've got the two units of five in the two Dreadclaws. First of all, that works out a lot cheaper because the Charybdis is 400 points and the Dreadclaws are only 115. So you can get two Dreadclaws and save yourself around 100 points straight out the gate, which is amazing. But on top of that, it allows you to separate those two, those f four units. So you could drop two of them on this side of the table and two of them on that side of the table. Or you could do something like drop two of them turn one and then the other two turn two. So it gives you the, the versatility to separate your drops. Whereas if all of them are in one Charybdis, it's a sort of an all out play where you're like, all of them are coming down now and it has to be amazing because I'm putting all of my eggs in that one spiky drop pod basket. So I would advise in most cases to take two dread claws over the one Charybdis. Uh, some of the things that you can put in your dread claws that are really good, uh, multiple small units of corn berserkers. So you could put one of them with two units of five and then the other one with a unit of eight or nine and then character support. This way you can drop a little package where you've got three units of berserkers and some characters. You can, if you make it world eaters, you've, they're all obsec and the world eaters have a relic or it's a warlord trait that gives a six inch aura of plus one to your charge rolls. So now when they drop in from their drop pods, when they're from their dread claws, they're looking for an eight inch on the dice and they can re-roll that. So an eight inch re-rollable charge. And when you've got three units trying to make that charge, that's three separate attempts, plus the attempts from the dread claws themselves, plus the attempts from the characters themselves. The chances of you making at least a couple of those is really, really high. So that means that you can drop this little nugget in and you can be relatively sure that the things that you drop against are going to die. If they've got a couple of units up the front of their army, you'll be able to go, cool, I'm gonna drop this little nugget and I'm gonna kill all of that shit. So that's one really good use for them is the Berserker Combat World Eaters bomb. It also allows you to get obsec units on objectives because those Berserkers are obsec. So if you drop it 
on an objective somewhere, even if your berserkers fail that charge. You've got obsec on an objective. You've got some charybdis, uh, or some dread claws, sorry, on that objective. So if they come near you, you've got these big punchy kind of units. It's um, it's not it's not OP. It's not top tier by any stretch, but it's cool and it's fun and it it's effective. It does what it does what's written on the box. You know, it it drops in and it punches shit. Some of the other candidates for the Dread Claws is you could put multiple units of Chosen and give them all Melter Guns, that's one option. And that way if somebody does try to screen you out with Rhinos early, you could go, okay, cool, well the, the Melter Gun Dread Claw is going to drop this turn and it's going to blow the screens up. And then next turn, the other two Dread Claws drop in with all the Berserkers and kill all the stuff that was protected by the, the screens. That's an option. Uh, you can put Havocs in them and give all your Havocs Reaper Chain Cannons. And one of the weaknesses of the Reaper Chain Cannon is that it's relatively short range and it can't target things out of line of sight. So your opponent can play around it pretty easily. However, if it's coming out of a Drop Pod, if it's coming out of a Dread Claw, there's not much they can really do to hide from it. And there's not much they can really do to stop you. So. That's really effective. You can put a couple of units of those in. If you make them Mark of Slanesh, you can double shoot with them, which is really powerful. Doesn't really have to be Emperor's Children, so to speak. You could make it any any of the legions, except for World Eaters, obviously. And um, you could make them Mark of Slanesh and use the, uh, whatever it's called, Endless Cacophony to shoot twice. And shooting twice with a unit of Chain Cannon Havocs is fucking brutal. So that's, an, that's another option. You could put a unit of five in there with some character support, or you could put two units of five in there and, and really double down on that DACA. Is quite effective. Uh, other things are, like, I mean, you could do Possessed, technically, but I wouldn't advise it. Um, you could do things like Cultists. There's a few options, but they're all kind of crap. I think the best ones are the Berserkers, the Chosen, the Havocs, or perhaps the Noise Marines. So the Noise Marines are good, they drop in, they do a lot of DACA on the turn that they drop, and also if you take them as Emperor's Children, they have a ton of stratagems that dial that damage up to 11, and also they have the Honor the Prince stratagem, which means that they can turn one of the dice after rolling a charge into a 6, which makes them very, very likely to make the charge on that turn that they drop. So if you take a unit of 10, put them in there, they disembark out, you cast prescience on them from somewhere down the table, and then you do a bunch of DACA, DACA shooting and then charge into something else with a unit of obsec noise marines is pretty powerful. Uh, the reason that I didn't say the, the noise marines first is because with the noise marines, I think they lend themselves more to the larger unit. So. The reason that I say that is because they have a whole bunch of stratagems that almost double their damage output and are able to stack. So for example, you could use the excruciating frequencies stratagem, which turns all of their guns from strength four, one damage to strength five, two damage. So if you use that on a unit of 10, you're getting an extra 30 shots that are double damage. Whereas if you use it on a unit of 60, uh, sorry, unit of 20, you're getting 60 shots that are double damage. So you're getting way more utility out of those command points that you've spent to upgrade their weapons. Same goes for veterans of long war. Same goes for a whole bunch of different abilities that you can put on these units. With the Emperor's Children and the Noise Marines, the bigger the unit, the more utility you get out of those stratagems. Now that's the same for World Eaters and the Corn Berserkers. The difference there is that because the world leaders are less likely to make the charge, having more units, more small units, means that you get more opportunities to roll those charge dice. So you're better off with multiple small units in world leaders, but you're better off with single, singular large units in the Emperor's Children. So that's where the Charybdis comes in, and the Charybdis is really good for that. The Charybdis also, I'd have to double check this, but I'm pretty sure the Charybdis can hold up to 10 Terminators. Now you might be thinking, why the fuck would you pay 400 points for a drop pod to hold Terminators that have Deep Strike 
teleport strike in their profile already? And you'd be, that's a perfectly fair cr question. You might not. But it does give you one thing that the uh, teleport strike doesn't give you, and that's the ability to drop turn one, which is not to be um, underestimated. Like, that's pretty powerful, dropping turn one, because it means that if your opponent has a small, like, narrow deployment zone, it means they can't really screen you out. Whereas if you have Terminators in, in Teleport Strike, they can't arrive until the second turn, second battle round. And what that means is that your opponent is guaranteed to get a movement phase before you arrive. And if they're getting a movement phase, if they're, say they're a, um, like a Harlequin's army, right? If you get Harlequin's on a Dawn of War deployment that's only 10 inches deep, if you can hit that turn one before they move, you'll actually be able to do a lot of damage. Whereas if you drop down on turn two, after they've moved, they're going to be able to push out some of their transports, push out some empty transports, push out some small units, and create a nice big ring around their meaty units in the middle. And it's gonna mean that you're not gonna be able to do effective damage to them. So, while it is a 400 point investment and that is very expensive, it can be absolutely game changing in certain situations. Plus, the Charybdis itself is a big 28 wound toughness 8 vehicle with missile launches that does a whole bunch of damage. It's actually not a bad investment in itself. So there's, there's definitely an argument for Terminators inside of a Charybdis or noise marines inside of Charybdis. I think the Charybdis is almost exclusively useful as an Emperor's Children unit, simply because you're able to drop down, you're able to double shoot the thing that comes out and make a very reliable charge. Whereas the Berserkers, they're not as reliable on the charge, so you're better off having them in MSU. And as we stated earlier, if you're going to do MSU, you're better off doing multiple Dreadclaws as opposed to a single Charybdis. If you did want some shooting in your army though, which is a valid point, the, the Charybdis provides its own shooting, whereas the Dreadclaws don't. So if you want to add some fire support to your World Eater's army, a Charybdis is not actually bad, because it can drop down, and if it drops down with Khan next to it, it gets full reroll to hit, which means you're dropping down, you're putting out 10 shots, you're rerolling all those hits. It actually makes it considerably more scary in the shooting phase. But, as we've said, if you do that, you're sort of committing to having, if you put four units of five Berserkers in it, or you put three units of Berserkers and a couple of characters in there, you're sort of now committing all of that has to come down at the same time. And it has to come down in the same place. And these are two things that a smart opponent is going to know that that's what's gonna happen. And they're gonna make sure that at any stage, they only present you with some insignificant targets. And you're gonna be like, damn it, I just wasted my entire bomb on killing this couple of units of guardsmen that stopped me from getting up close to their tanks or something to that effect. So I highly recommend if you're a World Eaters player like I am, you look into dread claws, multiple dread claws. And if you're looking to run a more powerful Chaos Space Marine list, perhaps look into a Charybdis with Noise Marines. Interestingly, the Noise Marines, I actually think they don't necessarily need the Charybdis transport. I've been running them without one, and I find that more often than not, your deployment zone will have somewhere where you can hide them. And because the Emperor's Children have a stratagem which allows you to redeploy, and also access to warp time, which allows them to move twice, and access to a stratagem that gives plus two to their movement characteristic, the Noise Marines are able to pretty much always deploy somewhere safe, and if your opponent gets first turn, that's fine, because you're safe, and if you get first turn, you can just spend a CP to redeploy, put yourself right up on the front line, move 16 inches, and then double shoot, and you, you're more, more than likely gonna be able to target something valuable in that first turn, even without the Dreadclaw or the Charybdis. So, personally, I think the Noise Marines probably don't need it, and same goes with the Terminators, because they already have inherent deep strike, they already have the teleport strike ability, they don't really need the transport. Being able to do it turn one is really cool, 
and it uh, catches a lot of people off guard, but I don't think it's strictly necessary, so I would probably avoid it, which essentially means that we're left back to either having dread claws with berserkers in them or with chosen havocs, that sort of thing. Uh, a healthy mix probably isn't bad. Being able to have, you know, maybe one one has world eaters, havocs, and Khan in it, and then the other one has the the other two have more world eaters, berserkers, and a character with the aura for reroll uh, for plus one charges. So now you've got these two sort of well, you've got three three pods and you're able to sort of mix them in and go, okay, this turn I want to drop and I want to do some shooting, and then next turn I want to drop down and do combat. You've got the versatility, or, or you might look at your opponent and be like, wow, they, they really screwed up their deployment. I'm going to drop down, do shooting, and I'm also going to drop all my combat stuff down, and I'm just going to overload them turn one, which is a really powerful thing to do. So, yeah, that's sort of where we're at with the... Dread Claws and the Charybdis. So there's some other notable mentions, like you can run Night Lords in them, which allows you to have a quite a reliable charge from Deep Strike as well. It's sort of tricky to pull off, but basically if you um, if the unit making the charge is entirely within a terrain feature, for two for oh, I think it's one CP, you get an extra two inches to your charge, which is pretty cool. Um, the problem there is a if you're running Night Lords to try and get that charge, you're probably better off just running Emperor's Children anyway and getting the guaranteed version and also access to the next level shooting damage. Whereas the Night Lords are sort of like, they're almost a halfway point between World Eaters and the Emperor's Children without all the stuff that makes those two things really good. They do bring a few of their own tricks, like the the, uh, the ability to deep strike in and turn off people's auras with your Charybdis turn one or your Dreadclaw turn one. That's pretty cool. Uh, and also their ability to stop things from falling back. So if you get into combat with somebody and don't kill them, they actually can't run away, which allows you to protect yourself from their first volley of shooting. So they've got a lot of cool tricks to them as well. Night Lords are definitely a, a potential um, option. It is. It will be hard to drop that unit down and then disembark entirely within a terrain feature so that you get those extra two inches though. And without those extra two inches, you're looking for a nine inch charge. That's really rough. That's unreliable and I would not recommend. A few other ones, there's, there's other ways you could do it if you weren't focusing on the charge. If, you, if, you, if you're trying to try and get a charge, you really want World Eaters, Empress Children, or maybe Night Lords. Whereas if you're thinking, I just want to have some Daka, I just want to have some really cool shooting units that are going to come down turn one and just go fucking Daka, 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 Daka and kill some shit. There's a few other options. You can, you can run um, Iron Warriors. They have some cool stuff. Like you can run Iron Warriors, put Havocs in there, and they do some shooting damage. There's a few other ones you can do. Alpha Legion have got some tricks. But personally, I think if you're going for shooting, you can't go past the Emperor's Children and the Noise Marines. And if you're going for combat, you can't go past World Eaters. And if you're going for both, if you want to do a mix, I think Emperor's Children edge out because they have the, the shooting power as well as the ability to charge from those Dread Claws when they arrive. So that's more or less where I've landed uh, with what I think is how this sort of thing operates. An interesting version of a list that I've seen is, or that I've been talking to a few of my Patreons about, is having three Dread Claws with Noise Marines in them and a big unit of 20 Noise Marines on the table. And that way, if your opponent um, doesn't uh, protect themselves well, you could move the big 20 unit up, like I said before, so redeploy it, move it, advance it, warp time it, get it all up in there, and then drop three units of noise marines off next to it, and then if one of those, you put a, um, the remnant of Marajavalia or whatever the fuck it's called, the relic that gives you a six inch aura of reroll wounds, 
And now not only is that aura affecting the big man, big 20 man bomb, but it's also affecting all of those 10 man bombs that drop down and are providing fire support as well. And when one of those 10 man units drops down and puts out 30 shots, even though it's only strength four with no AP and one damage, when those 30 shots are getting full rerolls to wound, they actually do contribute a cons like a non-insignificant amount. And if somebody drops, the, you know, they put some damage into your big unit, well now you can go, cool, well, I'll just put all those stratagems on one of my units of 10. And while you don't get the same amount of um, utility out of those units because you're not getting the same reward per CP that you spent, it's still a good deal. You know, just because it's not the best deal doesn't mean it's a bad deal. So that's a, an interesting list that I'd like to see explored a little bit further. Maybe I could look into something like that for upcoming events, or I could look into running more World Eaters, Khan, you know, maybe a couple of Demon Princes or some, you know, Dreadnoughts or Hellbrutes or something, I don't know. So yeah, give us, give us a, a yell in the comments below. Let me know what you think about the Dreadclaw. Let me know what you think about the Charybdis. Let me know what your stance is in regards to the ability to drop your entire army turn one in drop pods via drop pod assault. Let me know what you think, how that rule is supposed to be interpreted. And if you agree or disagree, or there's some conjecture in the comments, let's all work together, send GW an email and get them to correct this issue. Because if they fix this issue, then we don't have to have the argument. We don't have to contact TOs. We don't have to, you know, try and plan around it. And it just makes everybody's life way easier. So yeah, send them an email, comment in this video. Let's get a conversation going and I'll talk to you guys next time. All right, see ya. How you going guys, Dean from Blog for the Blood God here, and I am proud to announce that we are finally available to support on Patreon. My Facebook page and YouTube channel have always and will always remain completely free. However, what is not free is the equipment and programs required to make content like this. So if you'd like to show some support for the work that we do here, please jump over to Patreon, sign up, and show us some support. With your support on Patreon, we're going to be able to continue to produce and increase the quality of our battle reports, tournament coverage, tactical videos, painting tutorials, and other 40k hobby related material. With Patreon tiers starting as low as one Australian dollar per month, which is fuck all, you will be able to show your support and believe me, every dollar counts, it all adds up, and it will allow us to continue to increase the quality and bring you guys the content that you guys love. For the low price of one Australian dollar per month, you can become one of my renegade Astartes. For an extra dollar, I'll upgrade you to an aspiring champion. If you're really keen, for three dollars per month, you can become one of my corn berserkers. And for those of you who want to really dig deep and show your support for this channel, for five Australian dollars per month, you can become one of my Skull Champions. One of the main reasons for starting this exciting new Patreon account is so that we can get some support and work on some exciting big new projects. These projects include a whole host of new battle reports, both narrative and tactical, strategic, and competitive 40k battle reports. In addition, we are working on a brand new apparel line with a whole ton of different designs and we're partnering with a few different suppliers to work on neoprene objective markers. All of this will be first available to our followers on Patreon and then down the track available to people who follow us on YouTube and on Facebook. So if you want early access to these things, make sure you jump onto Patreon and show your support. All right, that just about sums it up, guys. If you've ever enjoyed any of the content that I've put out for free, please feel free to jump over to Patreon and show your support. That support will go a long way to making sure that we can continue to produce better and bigger content every single year, and we are never gonna stop, and we will never force people to pay. So, if you've ever gotten anything out of a battle report, if you've ever learnt something from a list breakdown, 
If you've ever learned anything from a Tactica video, or if you've ever just enjoyed having my content on in the background while you do some hobby, please show your support and join us on Patreon. Thanks for tuning in guys, and I'll see you next time. Long for the blood,